An extract from A Child's Christmas in Wales by Dylan Thomas. And then the presents after the Christmas box, and the cold postman with a rose on his button nose tinkled down the tea tray slithered run of the chilly glinting hill. He went in his ice-bound boots like a man on fishmonger's slabs. He wagged his bag like a frozen camel's hump, dizzily turned up the corner on one foot, and by God, he was gone. Get back to the presents. There were useful presents, engulfing mufflers of the old coach days, and mittens made for giant sloths, zebra scarves of a substance like silky gum that could be tug o' ward down to the galoshes, blinding tam o' shanters like patchwork tea cosies and bunny suited busbies and balaclavas for victims of head shrinking tribes. From aunts who always wore wool next to the skin, there were moustached and rasping vests. That made you wonder why the ants had en had any skin left at all. And once I had a little crocheted nose bag from an ant now, alas, no longer whinnying with us. And picture books in which small boys, though warned with co quotations not to, would skate on Farmer Giles's pond and did and drowned. And books that told me everything about the wasp, except why. Go on, the useless presents. Bags of moist and many coloured jelly babies, and a folded flag and false nose, and tram conductor's cap, and a machine that punched tickets and rang a bell. Never a catapult. Once by mistake that no one could explain, a little hatchet and a celluloid duck that made, when you pressed it, the most unduck like sound. A mewing mew that an ambitious cat might make who wished to be a cow. And a painting book in which I could make the grass, the trees, the seas, and the animals any colour I pleased. And still the dazzling blue sky sheep are grazing in the red field under the rainbow build and pea green birds. Hard boiled toffee fudges and all sorts, crunches, crankles, hamburgs, glaciers, marzipan, and butter Welsh for the Welsh. And troops of bright tin soldiers who, if they could not fight, could run away and snakes and families and happy ladders and easy hobby games for little engineers complete with instructions oh easy for Leonardo and whilst to make the dogs bark to wake up the old man next door to make him beat on the wall with his stick to shake our pictures off the wall and a packet of cigarettes you put one in your mouth and as you stood at the corner of the street and you waited for hours in vain for an old lady to scold you for smoking a cigarette and then with a smirk, you ate it. And then it was breakfast under the balloons. Always on Christmas night, there was music. An uncle played the fiddle, a, co a cousin sang Cherry Ripe, and another uncle sang Drake's drum. It was very warm in the little house. Auntie Hannah, who had got onto the parsnip wine, sang a song about bleeding hearts and death. And then another in which she said her heart was like a bird's nest. And then everybody laughed again, and then I went to bed. Looking through my bedroom window out into the moonlight and the unending smoke coloured snow. I could see the lights in the windows of all the other houses on our hill and hear the music rising from them up the long, steady falling night. I turned the gas down, I got into bed. I said some words to the close and holy darkness, and then I slept. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkey, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, pigs, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings, fruit and punch, all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, as they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning, where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music. In scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings and from the tops of their houses, whence it was mad delight to the boys to see it coming plunging down into the road below and splitting into an artificial snowstorm. The house fronts looked black enough and the windows blacker, contrasting with the smooth white sheets of snow upon the roofs and with the dirtiest snow upon the ground which last deposited has been piled up in deep fires by the heavy wheels of carts and wagons 
Photos that cross and recross each other hundreds of times where the grey streets branched off and made intricate channels, hard to trace in the yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy and the shortest streets were choked up in a dingy mist, half broad, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in showers of sooty atoms and in all the chimneys in Great Britain had what had, by all consent, caught fire and were blazing away to the dear heart's content. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate of the town, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad that the clearer summer air and brightness sun, summer sun might have endeavoured to diffuse in vain. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the carpets, and now and then exchanging facetious snowballs better natured missile far than many worthy jets, laughing heartily if, if it went right and not less heartily if it went wrong. The potters' shops were still half open and the fruiters were radiant in their glory. There were great round pot belly baskets of chestnuts, shaped like the waistcoats of jovial old gentlemen, lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the streets in their apologetic opulence. They were ruddy, brown-faced, broad-girthed Spanish friars, and winking from the shelves of water and slyness at the girls who went by, and glanced demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids, and there were bunches of grapes made in the shopkeepers, benevolent to dangle the conspicuous hooks that make people's mouths may water gracious as they pass. There were piles of footbirds, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance, ancient walks along the woods, and pleasant shuffling ankle deep through the withered leaves. There were north of Biffins, squab and coffee, set off the yellow of the orange and lemons, and in the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The very gold and silver fish set forth among these choice of fruits in a bowl. The members of the dull and stagnant blooded race appeared to know that there was something going on, and to the fish went gasping round and round their little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers, oh the grocers, nearly closed but perhaps two shutters down, or one, but through those gaps such glimpses. It was not alone that the scale descending on the counter made a very sound, or that the twine or roll of parted company so briskly, or that the canister were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose, or even that the raisin was so plentifully and rare, the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sh sugar as to make the coldest lookers on feel faint and subsequently bias. Nor was it that the figs were moist and plumpy, or that the fresh crumps blushed in a modern tartness, that their high decorated boxes or that everything was good to eat and its Christmas desk. But the customers were also hurried and so eager to hopeful promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the door, clashing their wicker baskets wildly, and left their purchases upon the counter and came running back to fetch them, and committed hundreds of them, like mistakes, in the best humour possible. While the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that the polished hearts which with which they fastened their aprons behind might have been their own, worn outside in general inspection, and the Christmas dawns to peck as if they chose. But soon the steeples called good people all, the church and the chapel, and away they came flocking, through the streets in their best clothes and with their gayest faces. And all at the same time they emerged from scores of side streets, lanes, and nameless turnings, innumerable people, carrying their dinners to the baker's shop. The sight of these poor revellers appeared to be an interest to the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in the baker's doorway, and taking off the covers of their bearers past, sprinkling incense on their dinners from his torch. 
and it was a very uncommon kind of torch. For once or twice, when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who have jostled each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humour was restored directly. For they said, it was a shame to quarrel on Christmas Day, and so it was. God love it, so it was. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon, to which a black small swan was a matter of course, and in truth there was something very like that in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand in a little saucepan hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened up the apple sauce, Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner of the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not thinking themselves and mounting guards upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be held. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was set. It was succeeded by a breathless pause, as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight rose all around the board. And even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with a handle of his knife, and feebly cried to her There was never such a goose. Bob said he didn't think there was ever such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavour, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by apple sauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped up in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Miss Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it, while they were merry with the goose. A supposition in which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other with the long dresses next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half and of half a quarter of ignited brandy and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, wonderful pudding. Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that when the weight was off her mind, she had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been flat heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed, blushed at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, and the heart swept, and the fire made up. The compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table, and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew around the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half of them, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers, and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug either as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks, while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Which all the family re echoed. Advent. Es treibt der Wind im Winterwalde, die Flockenherde wie ein Hirt, und manche Tanne ahnt, wie balde, sie fromm und lichterheilig wird, und lauscht hinaus, den weißen Wegen, streckt sie die Zweige hin, bereit, und wehrt dem Wind und wächst entgegen, der eine Nacht der Herrlichkeit. Advent bei Wind in the winter forest, the wind drives the flock of snowflakes like a shepherd. And the fir tree senses how soon it will be blessed with, a, with candle light, and stains to hear it stretches its branches towards the white path, ready, resisting the wind growing towards that one night of glory. spread their Christmas tune to the night beneath my cottage eaves, while smitten by a lofty moon, encircling laurels thick with leaves, give back a rich and dazzling sheen that overpowered their natural green. 
Through hill and valley, every breeze had sunk, had sunk to rest with folded wings. Keen was the air, but could not freeze, nor check the music of the strings. So stout and hardy were the band that scraped the cards with strenuous hand. And who but listened? Till was paid, respect to every inmate's claim. The greeting given, the music played, in honour of each household name, duly pronounced with lusty call, and Merry Christmas wished to all. Once there was a snowman who stood outside the door. He wished that he could come inside and run about the floor. He wished that he could warm himself beside the fire so red. He wished that he could climb upon the big white bed. So he called to the north wind, Come and help me pray. For I'm completely frozen, standing here all day. So the north wind came along and blew him in the door. And now there's nothing left but a puzzle on the floor. Help wanted by Timothy Totcher. Santa needs new reindeer. The first bunch has all grown old. Dasha has arthritis. Comet has a cold. Prince is sick of staring at dancers big behind yuck. Cupid married Blitzen and Donda lost his mind. Dancer's mad at Vixen for stepping on his toes. Vixen's been thrown out for laughing at Rudolph's nose. We hope you'll apply. If you're a reindeer, we hope you'll apply. There's just one tricky part. You must know how to fly. The End Talking Turkeys by Benjamin Zephaniah Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas because turkeys just want to have fun. Turkeys are cool, turkeys are wicked and every turkey has a mum. Be nice to your turkey this Christmas. Don't eat it, keep it alive. It could be a mate and not on your plate. Say yo, turkey, I'm on your side. I got lots of friends who are turkeys and all of them fear Christmas time. They want to enjoy it. They say humans destroyed it. And the humans are out of their mind. Yeah, I got lots of friends who are turkeys. They all have a right to be li to a life. Not to be caged up and genetically made up by any farmer and his wife. Turkeys just want to play reggae. Turkeys just want to hip hop. Can you imagine a nice tur young turkey saying, I cannot wait for the chop. Turkeys like getting presents. They want to watch Christmas TV. Turkeys have brains and turkeys feel pain in many ways like you and me. I once knew a turkey called Turkey. He said, Sky, explain to me please. Who put the turkey in Christmas? And what happened to Christmas trees? I said, I'm not too sure, Turkey, but it's nothing to do with Christmas. Humans get greedy and waste more than need be, and businessmen make loads of cash. Be nice to your turkey this Christmas. I invite them indoors for some greens. Let them eat cake, and let them partake in a plate of organic grown beans. Be nice to your turkey this Christmas and spare them the cut of the knife. Join Turkeys United and they'll be delighted and you will make new friends for life. 2020, wow that's come fast. But what's this? The virus. Could this year be our last? Covid, lockdown, homeschooling, Staying at home. All the shops going empty, all the food flying off the shelf. No more family and no more fun. Staying at home or time with my mum. What a year this is 
this has turned out to be. I need... But what's this? A dog. We have a dog. Fun. Finally, something good has happened. But what will it be like going back to school? I can only imagine. I totally forgot what it's like to be a friend. How to smile. How to laugh. How to hug. How to be a teenager. This year hasn't been as it was planned. Let us hope next year isn't as My planned. year as it is by Bella Watson. I thought it was going to be great. This is going to be the year. New year, new me. What did I know? I had no idea. Covid, lockdown, death, corona, global pandemic, family separated, can't meet up, all alone. I can't imagine being all alone. But I'm not alone. Back to school. I'm allowed to see my friends now. More friends than ever. There's a spring in my step. I'd almost forgotten how. I smile. I laugh. I hug. I'm a teenager. By Darcy Balshaw. January came with Brexit along the way. February was not a blast because my foot did not last. March was a pain because lockdown came. April came but we were all harassed. May was the same, boring old days. June was a cruise, but it crashed. July was a maze, writing essays. August went fast with a dash. September turned into autumn days and going back to school. October came, but Corona was still in the way. November was my birthday, 13 at last. December was Christmassy, watching the Grinch all day. In 2020, lockdown came. Staying at home was the new norm. Schools closed, giving Covid the blame. Lockdown was in full form. Farming was a go, it did not stop. Jobs to be done. The mower cutting with a big chop. The hay bob came and spun. The baler bunched up the crop. Then came the wrapper and then we were done. People stocking toilet roll. The NHS to the limits. Everyone panicking, scattering like a mo. More people ill. 2020 by Maybelline Stone. January came and so did my birthday. Resolutions were made with pride. Georgie Wojcicki came back with a yay, only soon to step aside. February was rough, quite dark and cold, but no so to make a giant snowball. The worst news though was that I was told I could, no I could have no birthday party at all. March arrived, bringing lockdown with it. My mum's birthday came and went. All the presents I gave her were a hit, but my money was all gone and spent. April, Easter, they both came. Homeschooling was still going on. The lockdown rules were still, still the same, and all the Easter chocolate I had was gone. May, May was sunny and bright, and summer was come on its way. My cats kept on having a funny fight, and we also visited Bay. June brings a sister's birthday, and now summer's officially here. Sometimes in the sea I'd lay, then get an ice cream with a cheer. July, oh, it was much too hot. I stayed indoors most of the time. Cause in Barney's cute, he's still a tiny tot, and as a dare, I ate a lime. August arrived near the end of lockdown. I was buzzing about going to school. We wandered around without a frown, but I wished I could go to a pool. September was here, back to school for year eight. There were no new pupils at first. Walking up to school, making sure I'm not late, but when no one had joined, our bubbles burst. October came, bringing Halloween with it, dressing up creepily and having fun. At first I didn't want to dress up one bit, but I was glad that I did by the time it was done. November is full of hard work and play, English and drama are the best subjects of all. I'd get home to my cats after a hard working day, dumping my bag in the messy hall. December has Christmas, presents and snow, it's nearly time for the return of Doctor Who. Christmas decorations are all on show and for next year we don't know what will The new year began, back to school we went, not with a tan, once a new accent. Coronavirus came, Boris Johnson gave some speeches, families fading in pain with empty Whitby beaches. Home learning is quite tough, mum and dad are helping. After a few days I'll think it's enough, even the dog is yelping. New dog arrived on the 8th of May, missing his family and friends. He's always wanting to run and play, now playtime never ends. New rules came, came in, having to wear masks on our face, 
disposable ones being put in the bin after one in every place. 2021, just round the corner. Sporting events being held. Hopefully the weather is getting warmer and for the athletes we cheer and yell. Hopefully we don't have to wear masks. In March, I turn 13. I will have a list of presents I must ask. Will it be the best birthday I've seen?